Is this? Yes. Okay. I'm going to move this. Yes? Hello? Hello everyone, thank you for coming to Metcalf Small. My name is Nandan. I'm here to introduce our speakers, Alex Colvin and Landon LaSmith. They're going to be talking about scaling your open data hub for fun and production. Please welcome them. You want to trade places? Uh, I'll drive for you. Test, test, test. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm Landon Smith. Uh, I am on the team that's primarily responsible for um, working on the Open Data Hub. I'm passionate about Linux and all things containers. And unlike Alex, I am not a beekeeper, but I like honey. Um, Alex is much more interesting, and I'll let him introduce himself. Cool. Yeah, so I'm Alex Corvin. Uh, like Landon, I'm a software engineer here at Red Hat. I work sort of on the Open Data Hub, but I'm primarily focused on running Red Hat internal instance of the Open Data Hub. Um, I'm kind of like a, a systems engineering, DevOps, SRE, site reliability engineering kind of guy. That, that's what, what gets me excited. So like scaling systems, that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, unlike Landon, as he said, I am a beekeeper. So, you know, if you want to talk about bees after this, yes? Do you like honey? I don't really like honey. It's weird. I, uh, I like having projects, and I get bored if I don't have something to keep me busy. So I saw a post on Reddit one day about beekeeping, and I thought it seemed interesting. So now I'm a beekeeper. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's who I am. Um, so what you can expect from this talk is we'll just introduce the Open Data Hub, um, and we'll talk about fun versus production with a heavy emphasis on production, which is Alex's expertise. Uh, challenges that we faced while scaling our internal instance of the Data Hub, and then answer any questions. So uh, what is the Open Data Hub? So first and foremost, it's a reference architecture for running data and machine learning projects on OpenShift. So uh, we want to develop a community where uh, we can give you best practices for how to deploy different uh, tools on OpenShift environments, in OpenShift environments. Um, and our primary way of doing that is develop a development of a meta operator. So a meta operator is essentially we are an operator that will handle the deployment of other operators and custom resources in OpenShift. Um, we're not trying to control the whole stack. Uh, we just want to make it easier for uh, DevOps, data scientists, data engineers to deploy an environment on OpenShift. Uh, so, the uh, data hub. So, at a high level, these are kind of the core parts that we're focusing on. Uh, so, in the DevOps, uh, we have support for monitoring, optimization, and model serving. Uh, the data engineer, we uh, primarily focus on data storage using Ceph object storage. Uh, so, you can use your favorite kind of S3 commands, uh, AWS CLI, to um, uh, push that data and access it. Um, and the right now, the open data hub is focused on making it easier for data scientists to perform their workflow on OpenShift. So the Open Data Hub is, kind of, is primarily focused on the yellow and green parts for right now. Uh, Alex is working on the internal data hub whose core focus has been on the blue and green um, with some uh, uh, intersection for the data scientists. <laughs> So this is a very busy diagram of the uh, uh, low-level focus of the Open Data Hub. Uh, at the top, you'll see we have different um, tools for AI machine learning. Uh, right now, we are focusing on uh, Jupyter Hub to allow the data scientists to interact with uh, different tools. Um, we have uh, the Open Data Hub and AI library for ML applications. Uh, AI library is a collection of different models that you can import or use. Um, to, I guess, model your data. Um, Selden uh, is currently in the Open Data Hub, um, so you can create models and a uh, few other things. Uh, Alex right now is uh, working on the uh, data analysis portion, um, metadata management, and I think storage also. Yep. Yep. Um, so as the Open Data Hub grows, we are working to bring a lot of those internal Data Hub features that we've been using in production into the Open Data Hub. 
So uh, the Open Data Hub is fun. This uh, is as little as it can get. Uh, we want to make it easy uh, to allow you to deploy um, uh, different tools into your environment. So uh, it's modular. So if you want Jupyter Hub and Spark, but you don't care about monitoring, you can do that. Uh, I think we have an instance of it running internally where we're only focused on the Spark operator uh, for deployment. Um, without JupyterHub, uh, but it's completely up to the user when they deploy it. Um, so the uh, we want to make it easy to simplify the deployment and redeployment um, of your tools. So if you want to play around with different tools or, or, or uh, data sets, you can do that. If you screw something up, we'll, we'll let you wipe it out and redeploy it and just make it really simply and easy, or simple and easy. Uh, so that's the fun part. We're kind of focused on allowing you to easily deploy uh, everything you need. And if you screw it up, just burn it down and, and start it back up. Right. How do we plan for production? So this will just be kind of like uh, a quick talk. Alex has all the good information about how they actually do it in production. Um, but with the Open Data Hub, we enforce modularity. So if one product uh, breaks, we don't want it to bring down the whole stack. Um, that's one of kind of our core um, uh, tenets for adding new uh, components uh, to the Open Data Hub. So a component is something, uh, the individual piece that we're deploying. That could be Ceph Object Store, uh, Kafka, Prometheus Grafana, Jupyter Hub, Spark Operator, and uh, anything that we add in the future. Uh, reproducible behavior. So we want to make sure that if this does grow into a production system, that you can easily um, redeploy it with the minimum amount of effort uh, and have everything work. And uh, the key things we're trying to focus on uh, to make it ready for production is to get as many use cases as possible. Because uh, we want to know what breaks so that we can make the Open Data Hub better. Um, that's uh, probably the most important thing that we're uh, asking for uh, for production. So uh, the Open Data Hub is a community. So we want as many people to use it, uh, many people to contribute new components uh, so that we can figure out the best way to make it better. All right, so thank you, Landon, for giving the intro to like the Open Data Hub. I'm going to, real quick, give you an intro to what do I do on the Internal Data Hub? What does my team do on the Internal Data Hub? Can you guys hear me okay? I feel like I'm not doing a very good job of speaking into this, so let me know if I, if I start breaking out. Um, so, so first and foremost, the internal data hub, and I mean internal at Red Hat, we just call this the data hub, right, is a platform for enabling teams at Red Hat and an environment for enabling teams at Red Hat to do what we call become data centric, right? We want teams to have an environment where they can store their data and where they can, you know, reliably get access to that data and where they can, you know, explore and implement actual production workloads of various data science tools, right? So, so we we maintain this environment. We make sure that it's stable and reliable and meets their needs. Um, and then, uh, like a really big part of what we do is is you know reaching out and enablement to, to these teams to make sure that they know how to use our system, so that they, they know how to use the components of the Open Data Hub, so Jupyter Hub, Spark, what have you, um, and, and guide them through and tailor like our our our, our walkthroughs, our tutorials, our guides for actual meaningful use cases. For, for teams at Red Hat, right? Um, so that, that's, that's one really big part of our charter. Um, the other thing that we do is we're kind of a, a proving ground for the Open Data Hub itself. So kind of the model we've been working with is if there's a new component that we want to add to the Open Data Hub reference architecture, um, Usually we'll run it internally first and make sure that like we understand how to run this thing and we can do it so reliably. We kind of work out all the kinks before you know recommending to the world that they run this in their environments, right? Um, so 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 we're kind of the guinea pig, if you will, for for some of these components of, of the data hub. So and I'll get more in uh, I think the next slide actually about some of those things we're working on right now. Um, but so we're we're proving ground and but also related but an important facet to mention is like we are 
you know, kind of the, the customer zero initial point where all these components get to run at scale. So, you know, we're not we're not crazy scale right now, but like we're, you know, solid scale, a few hundred gigs of data running through our system a day. Like it gives us an environment with which to, to really prove out again that these components can actually work in a production environment. So I mentioned that you know we you know new components to the Open Data Hub typically go through us first. Um, I wanted to touch on a few different things we're, we're working on right now. Uh, the first is Kafka. Malik here back in the room has, has kind of been owning that. Um, that you know will, will I'll actually will will be a big part of my talk later on, um, but. We wanted to, you know, prior to Kafka in the Open Data Hub, um, our processes did not really scale. We didn't really build like a very effective streaming data-like platform, right? It was really hard to, to scale our processes and scale the architecture and, and scale how teams sent data to us and got access to it, right? Um, Kafka has been really helpful there, and it's like a, a very strong recommendation that we'll make to users of the Open Data Hub when, when building out their data-like platforms, right, is, is leverage Kafka for that. And again, I'll get more into that. Um, anyways, though, Kafka, um, I think it's in master now, right? Like, you can deploy Kafka with the Open Data Hub operator. I think that will be officially released and out on, like, Quay for you to pull in, in uh, a couple weeks, right? End of the month. Um, so the next thing that we're working on, um, we, we, we call this kind of overall, like we lump them all together in what we're calling the data catalog. Uh, specifically, though, there, there's three components. One is Hive, or I'm sorry, one is Hue, one is the Hive Metastore, and one is the Spark Thrift Server. So together, these do, do a couple kind of cool key things. One is they give you a kind of a, 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 a pane or a window through which to query your data and explore your data and you know move your data using familiar tools, specifically SQL. Um, so your data scientists, data analysts who are familiar with executing SQL queries can, can do so on your data now that's stored in like your S3 data like using traditional SQL tools. Um, the other thing that it lets you do is build out like rich sets of metadata about all of the different data sets that you have and store like sample data and schema data and you know arbitrary catalog information that you want about like who owns the data what is the SLA for this data you know like what is the volume of data etc um, store that in a database kind of alongside your data and then get really easy access to it through hue so the thrift server provides the the ability to execute SQL the Hive Metastore executes or provides the ability to store metadata, and Hue provides the ability to explore all of that. Um, so, so these are, are three components that we're, we've been leveraging now for a little while to build out our like our ETL extract, transform, load. I think uh, uh, pipelines internally here at Red Hat to get our data into a place where the data scientists can then work on it. Um, kind of working out the kinks. It's, it's working pretty well now, though, internally. Um, and that's another thing that we're hoping to have kind of out there publicly available for use at the end of the month. Um, so finally, the third thing we've been working on now for a while internally is Elasticsearch. Um, I'll talk some more about Elasticsearch later on, but um, we have a lot of teams internally at Red Hat who run their systems in production, right, typically on OpenShift, and these systems generate a lot of log data. Um, and, you know, if a production issue happens, you want to be able to get access to these logs to see what happened. The problem is OpenShift pods are ephemeral, and if the pod logs are only stored with the pod, it can become really difficult to get access to those logs because the pod is not there anymore. Um, so we we implemented Elasticsearch. Um, this has been around for a little while, but we've like kind of recently wrangled the beast, if you will, and are still working on that. But um, it provides like a really solid platform, Elasticsearch, with Kibana to visualize them for groups to be able to send us their operational logs and and view them in pretty much real time and, and, and see exactly what's going on and, and find like if an event is happening across multiple pods or whatever. You can do some really cool, powerful stuff with it. Um, so Elasticsearch, I don't think, is officially on the roadmap right now for adding to the Open Data Hub operator, um, but I, I think is something we would like to do in the future. Um, but so that, that's something we work on a lot internally is, is making sure that that's ready for prime time and that could be like easily installed. You know, as Landon said, we want to make sure that components of the Open Data Hub are, are really simple to get going with. 
Um, so we work on that a lot, and that's we want to get Elasticsearch to that kind of place before we'll, we'll officially make it part of it. Um, so anyways, full roadmap to the Open Data Hub operator is there if you want to check it out and see exactly what we're doing and when we plan to have it done. Um, so, so, so enough with that, now we're getting kind of like the exciting stuff, right? I wanted to talk about some challenges that we've faced internally while scaling the Open Data Hub. Um, my hope is that this will not be too specific to the Open Data Hub, that like if you don't plan to run the Open Data Hub, you'll still get some value from it. Um, some of it might be specific, so, uh, specific to running like a large big data platform or a data lake, um, but hopefully you'll be able to get some kind of generic nuggets out of this to, to use in your own production systems. Um, and there are, I believe, four specific areas that I want to talk about, four specific challenges we've had and how we're kind of tackling them. So the first one is monitoring. Um, if, if you came to my last talk, you know that this is something I feel passionate about, that like you should not feel comfortable calling a production service like production ready if it's not monitored and if you don't have alerts in place and if your team does not like understand what to do with those alerts, right? Um, so, so this is something that we've we spent a lot of time on. Um, and, and one of the cool things about the Open Data Hub operator is you get Prometheus and Grafana monitoring for free. And so like you know, my team's job is to make sure that the internal data hub is is like stable and reliable and available. Um, and a big part of how we do that is monitoring. Um, we typically do that with Prometheus and then Prometheus's alert manager component, which lets you pull metrics and then generate alerts based on those metrics and send those alerts to however you want to get alerts, pager duty, email, whatever, Slack. Um, so, so first thing I'll say is like, if you're running an application on Kubernetes or OpenShift, highly recommend that you play with Prometheus. Um, it integrates natively with Kubernetes. It makes it really easier to pull, easy to pull metrics from your systems. Um, it's really easy to add custom metrics to your your application if you have a you know custom Python app or API or whatever. Um, if you run something more like standard, like maybe you run a database server or you know Apache web server or, or something that's you know common, right? There are a multitude of, 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 of public open libraries, and they're called um, exporters in the Prometheus language, but um, that will give you a lot of really rich metrics from your application without having to you know, spend time becoming a super expert on whatever that application is to know exactly what to monitor, right? So, so that's the first thing, is leverage Prometheus to be able to monitor your applications. Um, let me read. So, so the other thing that I wanted to say that like has taken us time to learn is just making sure that the team knows what the metrics and resources and alerts are. Rather, um, you know, we I, I think kind of. In the olden days, we would deploy a, a service to production, maybe some monitoring, maybe not a lot of monitoring, um, and not necessarily taking the time to really understand the application and know what I actually need to monitor. Um, this is, has been like a learning experience for us with Spark and Jupyter Hub recently. Like, we've been, we've had Spark and Jupyter Hub deployed for a little while internally, um, but it was kind of a wild west, right? We, uh, I almost hesitate to call it a production service, right? We didn't really know what to, what to monitor about it, how to effectively monitor, what was worth alerting on, what to do when alerts generated. Um, so, so that's really the second big piece of advice I have for you here is like, if you're going to run something in production, take the time to understand how to run it. Like, you know, I mean, this. And if, if it's a database, you can you can leverage, for example, the MySQL exporter for, for Prometheus. So you don't have to do all the monitoring yourself, but take the time to research like, what do these metrics mean? What do I need to care about? And what's just kind of you know, white noise, right? So, so that's what I have to say about monitoring. Um, and certainly, I'm passionate about monitoring, so if anybody wants to come up and talk to me more about it afterwards, feel free. Um, so, so the second area, and this, this area I, I hopefully will have maybe some more nuggets, right? And it's something that like my team knows we, we've worked really hard on, and, and this is about scaling our processes. So when we first deployed the Open Data Hub internally, the Data Hub, um, we were kind of in like user acquisition mode, right? Like, so the important thing was we get it running, we get as many useful services running in it, and then like we work really hard to get teams at Red Hat using it, um, and we were successful with that. And I think I think a lot of teams 
might be, you know, this might be a familiar story. Like you're, you have success, you get a lot of people running using your system, and then more and more people start coming to you and wanting to use your system. And the problem is, like until now, you've been so focused on doing whatever it takes to get people using your system that you, it turns out you don't have like you don't have good, repeatable, scalable processes for onboarding new users. So for us, um, you know, we have a couple different storage platforms. One is our Ceph S3 data lake. One is Elasticsearch. They have different authentication methods. They have different patterns for writing data. They have different methods for reading data. They have different processes for adding a new user. They're just very different, right? Um, and that made onboarding new users really difficult. In Elasticsearch example, like we had to add new certificates to the Elasticsearch system with, you know, read and write permissions to whatever sets of indices. Then we had to do a production rollout of Elasticsearch, which took literally two days to do to add the new user. Um, and then for S3, there was this whole other process where you've got to get credentials and you got to create buckets and you got to assign users to buckets. You got to keep track of all of that stuff. Like it's just, it was very hard. And ultimately, what happened was is a request for a new onboarding thing would come in, and we'd see it, and we'd say, oh man, that, that process is a pain to do. I don't feel like doing it. I'm just gonna let that sit for a little while. Maybe somebody else on the team will do it. And then, you know, two weeks later, oh, that, that request has been sitting there forever. Oh, we better take care of that. Um, and it's just like, like a lot of stuff happens. You know, like team morale suffers. Nobody wants to be doing this stuff. It's not fun. You're spending all your time doing onboarding stuff. Um, it takes a long time, so now your team looks bad. Um, you know, you, you the important maintenance tasks don't get addressed. Like, so, so an example there is, um, I'll get more in depth and details on this in a second, but at some point in the history of our system, we started implementing controls for how long data would be kept around in our system. The problem was if we didn't have our processes for onboarding new users well-defined, those lifecycle policies wouldn't get applied, so now the system would start growing kind of unfettered and would, would you know get just in worse and worse health over time because we, we didn't have systems to adhere to. Um, similarly, like you know, our scaling considerations wouldn't get properly applied you know, like if there was a, a unique data set or a particularly large data set, we would have to do a particular process to onboard them. Um, and, you know, again, without well-defined processes, that wouldn't happen. Um, without well-defined processes, we wouldn't know what data was stored in our system. Or importantly, like if there's personal identifiable information in that, like are there are sensitive data sets? Like we just have all these things that when we when we didn't have well-defined processes for on, onboarding new systems. Like a lot of stuff went by the wayside, and it just over time it, it just became harder and harder to manage. So, my advice here is at some point you have to figure that out, right? Like at some point you have to sit back and, 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 and do the work, and maybe it's painful, but you have to do the work to figure out what the processes are. Get together as a team, write down everything that you have to do, make sure everybody understands the process, make sure it's documented, make sure everybody on the team can do the process, be really, really explicit with what the steps are, um, and just get it all down. And then, you know, maybe you realize that like, wow, this process is really bad, and this process is really hard, and it does not work. But you have it documented, and then you can start to improve it, right? And then maybe you can start to automate it. Um, that's kind of the, the, the phase that we're at internally right now. Um, um, and it, it's been it's been a little hard to get to, but I think we're we're at a good place now. Like we're you know instead of new new user onboarding taking you know weeks, it takes a couple of hours maybe, um, and that's been really good. And I think that as a as a result, we're going to be able to to go out kind of to the world now and tell them like this is how you should do it, and that's kind of our goal. So scaling our processes that's been a big challenge. <laughs> Uh, the next big challenge that we, we've kind of been working to overcome is sort of streamlining our architecture. So I'm going to talk through this diagram a little bit, but let me first say that like as your, you know, if you're running a production data lake, as your data lake grows and as you have more and more data sets going into it, um, in our experience, the logic for where, where that data goes or what to do with that data 
can become more and more complex, right? Um, in our case, in our system, we can store data in Elasticsearch, or we can store data in our Ceph S3 data lake. Um, traditionally, Elasticsearch has been used for things like log streaming, basic log analysis, and Ceph S3 has been used for more data science, data analysis kind of tools. Um, Reasoning for that, traditionally a lot of the tools we use are really good at working with like AWS S3, and so Ceph S3 provides an S3 API that these tools can work with, right? So if a team wants to do data science, we push them towards S3. If they want to do log streaming, we push them towards Elasticsearch. Um, but there are cases where the team wants to do both. And long term, we'd like to do something better, but right now we just write it to both, so there's duplication, that's okay. Um, Sometimes there are like transformations that have to happen on this data before they get sent to their final resting place, right? Um, so there are different processes, kind of different layers of processes that handle that. Um, and and again, going back to before we had this streamlined architecture, ooh, uh, streamlined architecture. It was, you know, it seemed like every time we added a new data source, we just added a new component to the data hub that would do that new thing, and it became very unwieldy and very, a lot of duplicated work and, and just like hard to maintain, right? That's kind of a, a theme here, is it became hard to maintain. Um, so what we did is we input, we introduced Kafka. So Dashbox, Kafka, Strimzy, uh, Kafka Connect. I think there have been other talks here, maybe specifically Molex around the Strimzy operator. If you want to run Kafka in Kubernetes or OpenShift, and you don't do it with Kafka, or if you don't do it with, with Strimzy, like, like use Strimzy. It's the way to do it, right? So anyways, it's Strimzy and his operator that runs Kafka in OpenShift um, or Kubernetes. So anyways, we run Kafka in front of the, open, in front of the data hub, um, and all new writes, all writes of data go through Kafka, and then that's us that lets us do really whatever we want. So like, if if the logic is pretty simple about where it goes to, it goes to Elasticsearch, it goes to it goes to S3. Like we have very generic ingestion layers that will handle that, right? So the data producers just basically like write it to the right place in Kafka with the right key. Our system handles where it goes. If it's more complex, we can have like a very consistent layer of we call them normalizers to do that those transformations that are necessary, right? And so they just read from Kafka right back to the right place, it ends up in Elasticsearch or S3, right? And so the benefit to this is that we don't have to worry about all the different like complexities of where data ends up. We can do things in a very like generic way that will scale. Um, and then we just have to worry about the stuff that's like from Kafka back. All of our data producers, if they want to start sending us data, we can create a topic for them in Kafka. We can tell them where to write it. We can tell them how to write it. The writing is on them. Um, so, and the, the other nice thing is that Kafka can become like Kafka is very easy to scale, right? You can add you can add topics, you can add topic partitions, you can add you can add consumers, right? So, and that's maybe not the case with some of the backend things like Elasticsearch or S3. So, if we have a burst of data, we can scale up Kafka, or or messages can kind of queue up in Kafka, um, and it gives us a lot of resiliency, right? That we may not have on the backend. So, recommendation here, like I'm a big Fan. Kafka, if you're not familiar with Kafka, it's an enterprise message broker's data streaming system, right? Like, if you have large amounts of data, if you have complex logic for where data should go, or if you have complex logic for transformation of data, I highly recommend you use Kafka. And so, again, back to the Open Data Hub. Um, we spent a lot of time to kind of understand how to run Kafka and how to architect Kafka as part of a d data streaming platform data lake. Um, and, like, we're really excited to be adding it to the Open Data Hub operator and, like, be able to provide it to the world to, to run as part of their data lakes on, on OpenShift. Um, okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is managing the volume of data. How am I doing on time? What do I have, 15 more minutes? Cool. So, um, for this, I put, if you build it, they will come. I don't know if it's it's a baseball movie reference, Field of Dreams. If you haven't, like, leave, go watch it. It's a good movie. Um, better than the rest of this talk. <laughs> no. um, so, so for us, this has been really true. Like, you know, I, I mentioned that for a long time we were working really hard on getting the data hub, like, to be a, a, a stable platform where people could write their data to. And I think we were successful with that. And now, now, now we're struggling with, like, 
our own success, you know? Like, how do, how do we make the data hub, like, we're operating at scale now, so that just brings all sorts of problems, or, or challenges, rather, I should say. Um, you know, like, if you build a shared data, like, platform, people are going to want to send their data to it. Um, and so one of the problems we've had is... Um, I think people have a, a way of sending you data and then kind of forgetting about it, or you don't really know what data you have, or you don't have, like, that data is only useful for a period of time, and you keep it around forever, right? So, so three kind of specific things I'll say here. One is, like, introduce controls for limiting how long your data is kept. So introduce data retention policies. This is really easy to do with Elasticsearch. There's a tool called Curator you can use to expire old indices. It's really easy to do with CFS3. You can implement data lifecycle policies utilize both and honestly like for, for us we're not quite here yet it, it's not a strict default but like we recommend like have default policies for how long data will be kept in your system and adhere to them and you know require a good reason not to adhere to them you know um, for us we like to default to keeping data around for 30 days um, you know and and we can be flexible on that but it, it forces people to think about like do I really need this data around and honestly sometimes there are there are use cases where there are regular, uh, regulatory requirements that you don't keep that data around forever. Um, requiring people to think about how long that they, 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 st they store your data, like, makes them think. Like, you know, it's better for everybody. You spend less on storage. Um, it's easier to scale because you don't have to scale as much. Like, you know, it's just, it's just easier. So strict data retention policy is, is the first thing. Um, the second thing I'll say that has been really... Um, important for us in managing the volume of data is implementing a way to keep track of the data that's in your system. So at some point, if you have a bunch of people sending data to you, it's impossible without a system to know what data do you have. The problem, like, if, if you don't know what data you have, then, like, why are you storing the data, you know? Um, you want your data scientists or data analysts to be able to explore what data is available and be able to do inter interesting things on it. Um, you don't want 50 teams at your company to all be storing the same set of data. Like there, there's so many benefits to being able to know what data you have in your system. And when you're when you're working with you know hundreds of gigs or more of data a day, you can't keep track of that manually, right? So this is where the the Hue and, and Hive Metastore and Spark Thrift Server solutions that I mentioned earlier comes in. Um, we think it's going to be a really scalable mechanism for keeping track of all the data and allowing people to easily explore it. So, you know, if you're running a data lake, have a tool like that. Um, and then the last thing here that I want to talk about is keeping track of who owns data. Uh, we can lump all this together under data governance. Um, who owns the data? Who has access to the data? Is there any sensitive information stored in this data? Who's the data about? Is it about a, you know, a system? Is it about a customer? Is it about a random person, right? Like, again, this is very, I, it's probably just one bullet point up there, but it is very related to just keeping track of the data, right? It's important to, to introduce these data governance policies. Um, again, we think that the data catalog solution we're working on will really help with this. Um, but honestly, like this is an area that we're, we're still not fully mature yet internally, and it's something we're working on. Um, if you're working on a, a data lake and you have experience with this, we'd love to talk to you about it. But um, it, it's certainly an important area to consider. And I think we're, like with, with things like GDPR and CCPA, with the California Consumer Privacy Act that's similar to GDPR that's coming out, like it's, it's like becoming very important that you know what data you have. Everybody's concerned about privacy, right? Like, you have to know what data is in your system, and you have to know who owns the data, and you have to know, you know, if it's subject to regulatory approvals, or if it's or processes, or if it's, you know, if there are processes defined for, you know, getting access to the data, who can have access to the data, how do you delete the data, how do you update the data? Like, again, when your system starts to scale, you have to have processes in place for knowing all this stuff and keeping track of it, or you just, you're, you're, you're not going to be successful. 
So finally, I think the last kind of challenge area that I wanted to talk about is organizing data. Oh, no, there's two more areas. I lied. There's five, not four. Second to last is organize data efficiently. So, so this is going to get kind of into the nitty gritty about Elasticsearch and CephS3 for a second. Um, Again, when we initially deployed the data hub, when we were scaling up, we just kind of wrote data wherever, right? Um, over time, we've learned that that was a bad idea. Specifically for CFS3, we had like, so S3, if you're not familiar with it, you organize data into what are called buckets. Um, Initially, we had like five or six maybe buckets that we just wrote everything to. And those buckets over time got really, really big. Um, recently, we started having issues with our CFS3 server. And access started getting really slow. The system became very unreliable. Requests were like timing out. Processes were failing. We looked into it. And we, the first thing we saw was that the one problem child bucket had something like 15 million objects in it. Um, we started talking to Ceph Engineering and to Red Hat Support, and we learned that there's kind of this, you know, if you're in Ceph Engineering or Support, kind of a, a widely known rule of thumb that a Ceph bucket should not have more than one and a half million objects in it. So we were, you know, order of magnitude over that recommendation. That has been fun to deal with. We, I think we're, this was back in like March we learned about this. Um, I have a process, if I, I can pull it up right now, it's still working on moving data around. Um, because we're having to, to move data into different buckets and batch data and make, you know, combine objects. And it has been a pain. <laughs> so my recommendation here is like, if you're storing data in S3, we have learned, one, that buckets are cheap. Like, don't be afraid to create multiple buckets and like come up with a plan for putting your data in these different buckets, right? Um, that's recommendation one. It's really easy. Create different buckets, store your data in different buckets. Um, in addition to that, or if you can't do that, come up with a plan for just like how, like, in, like, you, the actual objects, what you're going to store in those objects, right? So. One recommendation that we have is for data that is read frequently, maybe this is new data as it comes in, you know, like in, in the, the log example, these are today's logs or this week's logs. If you need to access those a lot, data you access frequently or that is write, written frequently or whatever, store that in maybe dedicated buckets or maybe store that as a bunch of smaller objects and you can access them really quickly, right? But then in the background or over time or at a regular interval or whatever you want to do, go through and reprocess those. So that's what we're doing right now is we're taking all these really old millions of objects and combining them into a significantly smaller number of substantially larger objects. Um, that way you reduce the total number of objects that you have, doing operations like listing objects becomes very fast, um, and you don't really have to access that data that often. So if there's a little bit more of an overhead to getting to the data, like I think that's that's okay. Like that's a, that's an okay trade-off in my book. So so that's the biggest concern we've had around organizing data in S3. We have had a similar problem with Elasticsearch. Um, we haven't fully solved this yet, but I think we know how to solve it. So we, we've, we've kind of put a band-aid on the situation. Um, background on Elasticsearch real quick. Elasticsearch stores data in indices. Indices are split into shards. Nodes in an Elasticsearch cluster has to keep track of all these shards in like metadata, right? So you can know where data is stored. All of that metadata is stored in memory in Elasticsearch. And there are limits to how many shards Elasticsearch recommends that you store on an individual node before it starts performing badly. Um, that's based on the amount of memory that an Elasticsearch node has. And then the JVM has a maximum amount of RAM heap space that it can keep track of. So there's, there's a maximum to the number of shards that you can have on an Elasticsearch node. And it ends up being somewhere in the neighborhood of 600. Um, Data stored in our system is stored based on indices, and those indices, a really easy pattern, so, so you want to you wanna limit the number of indices that you have, and you want to limit the size of indices, otherwise it takes a really long time to query your data. A really easy pattern to do in the log example is just create a new index for every single day. So a lot of people do that. It's really easy. Um, the problem with that is maybe you have one data set that generates gigs and gigs and gigs of data in a day. And then maybe you have another data set that generates 
you know, a few kilobytes of data in a day. Both of those indices are going to get rolled over every day. And so over time, what you have is a bunch of shards of wildly disparate sizes. And that's like, it's inefficient, right? It's, it's not optimal. Um, remember that there's a limit to the number of shards that you can have. You want to optimize the size of those shards, and you want to optimize the number and, and the allocation of those shards. If you're wasting those precious shard limits with a bunch of really, really small shards, you're going to have to either massively scale up your cluster, or like the cluster performance is going to suffer. Um, so, so similar to how you have to plan for bucket placement or object placement in S3, you need to plan for your sharding pattern in Elasticsearch. Um, I mentioned, you know, a lot of people just roll over the indices every day. That's really easy to do. It's kind of the kind of the, the, the low cost, easy, lazy way. The better way, though, that we've that we've discovered is using what's called the Elasticsearch rollover API. Um, again, this is kind of super Elasticsearch technical. If you're using Elasticsearch, though, you, sh you should explore this. Basically, what you do is you specify a size that you want your shards to be, and it does not create a new index unless your shards hit that threshold. So it allows you to, across the board, in a really easy, scalable way, manage the size of your shards, optimize the size of your Elasticsearch cluster based on how much data you actually have in need. So organize your data efficiently. And the final area that I want to talk about is just running in containers. So containers are obviously by nature ephemeral, right? And sometimes it feels a little bit like fitting like a square peg in a round hole. The opposite of that, though, because I think that would actually work, a circular peg in a square hole. Um, <laughs> Um, so, like, the fact that we run a data lake, like, this is all very persistent applications that have persistent storage. Everything about it is persistent. It's a little bit at odds with an ephemeral container, right? Um, a couple things, I guess three things we've learned that can help you kind of reconcile this. The first is use operators, right? So Kubernetes operators are containers that manage an application, basically, in a nutshell, right? Um, and, and typically, these operators are developed by people who know the application. I have three minutes left. i got to go fast. Um, Leverage their work, right? Like, don't put all the time into figuring out what it takes to run Kafka in OpenShift when the Strimzy team has already done all that work for you, right? Leverage their work. Do what they've like. They've taken all the guesswork out of it for you. Do like use what they've done. All this stuff is open source. Just just use it, right? So one, use operators. Don't reinvent the wheel. Two is plan for redundancy. So. Kafka, Strimzy, if, if you're working with those, and, and you know, on a more generic level, OpenShift have have a few different mechanisms you can leverage for like fault tolerance or high availability or redundancy, that kind of thing. Um, three specific ones are with Kafka partition replicas. That's you know not OpenShift specific, but replicate your data. Do, you can do the same with thing with Elasticsearch, right? So just plan for plan for failure, plan for things to be ephemeral, create copies of it. Two is pod anti affinity. Elasticsearch makes it really easy to control on what underlying OpenShift, I'm sorry, OpenShift makes it really easy to control on what underlying OpenShift nodes your pod runs. Leverage that. Don't put all your applications in the same basket, right? Put them all on different nodes. Um, finally, in Kafka, you can use something, what's called node placement, that allows you to put your topics on different nodes. Um, I'm close, right? All right, let me wrap this up. Um, you can do similar things with Elasticsearch to control which nodes your Elasticsearch shards run on. Um, and then finally, the last thing I want to talk about were leverage available storage options. So OpenShift gives you the ability to use like host path, host path mounts. So if you have something that requires really, really fast storage, you can use local NVMe storage, have that right locally in your OpenShift pods. Or you can use something like Ceph, which is container native storage that works really well. Um, so just tailor your needs to the kind of storage you have available to you. Again, we can talk more about that if I need. And I don't actually know what time this ends, but that's the end of what I have. I can take questions if you have them. Do I have time for questions? Cool. I have time for questions. <laughs>
for the Kafka, uh, when you do the normalize, uh, where did you uh, get the normalize done? Inside of Kafka, like uh, when you write in the topic? So yeah, so right now we use something called Logstash. Um, over time, we'll probably use Kaf Kafka connectors more, um, and, and maybe in some cases do like custom Python daemons or whatever language. But the pattern is read data. So, so data goes into Kafka in like an ingestion topic. Our normalizers, and then on the back end, there's like an official, like final level topic that is the last stop before everything gets dumped into Elasticsearch or Ceph, right? In the middle, these normalizers can run, pull data from the frontline ingestion topic, do what it needs, write it to that final line topic where it gets dumped blindly into Elasticsearch or Ceph. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, did you ever consider um, having like the people that use the the hub to manage their own S3? Like, give me your S3 credentials, and it's your problem and not yours. So. We do give S3 credentials out to individual users. So uh, I, I think you're asking about reconnect to their own S3 clusters, right? Um, we could certainly do that, and the tools that we give them, like Jupyter Hub or, or Spark, are typically like S3 agnostic. Like if they have their data stored in AWS S3, they could just connect it to it. Um, the problem with making the act like our Ceph S3 cluster kind of the wild west and letting people do whatever they want is one bad actor can we've found bring down the whole thing. So the issue we had is I mentioned we had that one big bucket with 15 million objects, but what happened is people would execute a query on that bucket, their client would eventually time out, but in the back end in Ceph, that query would keep running. The client, they'd think, oh, my, my command failed, I better run this again. So on the back end, you have all these really expensive queries running that don't finish, they bring down the whole cluster. Um, I think that's something that hopefully will get fixed or improved in the product. Um, this this experience has really let us like work with the Ceph engineering team a lot to try and make this stuff better. I think just just out of this experience of learning about Ceph, there's at least two bugs that have been fixed in Ceph. So hopefully this will get better. But right now, like everybody kind of has to play nice. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, everyone.